young Earth creationism is precluded entirely by dozens upon dozens of well-known facts of the natural world. From the radioactive decay law, the speed of light, and the nature of the geologic column, to the statistics that surround common ancestry, the fossil record, and our genetic relationship to the rest of the primates, mammals, and really just the entire tree of life. But so frequently I encounter what I am calling bite-size busts, aspects of STEM fields that entirely preclude young earth creationism that aren't typically talked about, but bust hard nevertheless. Be it geology, anthropology, astronomy, or physics, here we discuss the minutia of fields that leave young earth creationism out in the cold. If you're new to the channel, don't forget to subscribe if you like this kind of content, leave a like and maybe a comment, and if you feel like supporting the channel in other ways, you can check out my Patreon, my PayPal, or stores. My gentle and modern apes, today we will be discussing how one rock easily manages to preclude young earth creationism. Limestone. Limestone, or calcium carbonate, is a type of sedimentary rock with two primary polymorphs, or different types, of commonly occurring mineral, calcite and aragonite. Both calcite and aragonite are CaCO3. However, the calcium, oxygen, and carbon atoms are arranged differently in the two minerals. One common type of limestone is chalk, which consists of very fine-grained calcite fossils. Sedimentary rocks make up 75% of the rocks at the Earth's surface, but only 5% of the outer 10 miles of the planet. Of that sedimentary rock, approximately 10% is limestone, and of that 10%, the majority has a marine rather than a freshwater origin. Much of this marine limestone happens to be chalk, which is, as previously mentioned, made up primarily of microfossils, or the skeletons and shells of trillions upon trillions of marine microorganisms. This is known as biochemical formation. Regular chemical formation is also possible, although it's thought to be less common and typically results from direct precipitation out of the water. But deposits of any kind of marine limestone can be hundreds of meters thick, such as those seen in the cliffs of Dover, the Stone Forest, or the Redwall Limestone. Other predominantly limestone cliffs can even reach thousands of meters in height, such as Notch Peak. These mixed cliffs are limestone dolomite compositions. Dolomite is another type of carbonate mineral that is known as CaMgCO3 2 Unlike limestone, dolomite does not tend to accumulate and is instead secondary in origin. Typically, secondary dolomite results from the conversion of buried calcite, a process that a 2016 paper found occurs at a maximum rate of 10 raised negative 6 centimeters per year and a minimum rate of 10 raised negative 11 centimeters per year. This is certainly not conducive for creationism, especially given the size of Notch Peak, but we'll be discussing dolomite in depth at another juncture. There are three terms that are important to appreciate moving forward. The first is precipitation. This is when calcium carbonate falls out of the water in which it was dissolved. Then there's deposition, which is the placement of this precipitated calcium carbonate. And finally, there is accumulation, which is the net gain of calcium carbonate on the floor, accounting for removal via currents and height loss by compression. This could be annual by the decade, century, etc., and tends to be specified in the study that's being considered. So what's the problem with limestone then? As we all know, young earth creationism requires a spontaneous creation event some 6,000 years ago, as well as a global flood event some 4,400 years ago that is responsible for all layers of the geologic column from the Cambrian to the Cretaceous, as well as their fossils, every impact event or mass extinction signature within said layers, the current positioning of the continents, the state of decay of all radioactive elements, and finally, the various levels of diversity for all extant life. Limestone is problematic because it simply cannot accumulate during the flood, especially given the flood's tumultuous conditions and a minuscule time scale. Let me show you what I mean, or should I say, what I mean. 
Limestone has a variable precipitation rate, and thus a variable deposition and accumulation rate too, depending on several factors. The first is temperature. Precipitation will be faster in warm conditions and solubility will go down as temperature goes up. Current, precipitation of limestone, occurs only in calm conditions. Acidity, accumulation is prevented in acidic conditions. And pressure, precipitation is faster as pressure is lessened. You can probably already see where this is going, considering Noah's flood is rarely characterized as a warm, calm, low pressure, and low acidity environment. We know that the global average of limestone accumulation, which is of course the result of varying precipitation rates, is approximately 1.5 times 10 raised 15 grams on the total of our ocean floor. More specifically, in the Bahama Banks today, we can measure the accumulation of limestone at a rate of about 3.6 centimeters or two inches per year, or 50.6 meters, 166 feet, per 1,000 years. The Bahama Banks are a very ancient limestone accumulation zone, beginning perhaps in the early Jurassic, judging on its current core depth. It is considered by many to be one of the fastest observed rates of limestone deposition currently in progress. But this is just what's observed today, now, in the present. Young Earth creationism requires just an absolutely bonkers fast accumulation rate, one that is several orders of magnitude faster than the fastest observed rate today. And aren't these guys all about observable science? I hope so. No, okay. Okay. Ah! <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So what kind of conditions can we give them to maximize that rate and see what is possible under their given time scale? Warm water, calm seas, low pressure, and low acidity are essentially what is required to maximize limestone precipitation, deposition, and thus accumulation. Water that's too hot is going to be problematic as it reduces the ability of seawater to hold calcium carbonate. And to take that to the next level, water that reaches supercritical levels, as some young earth creationists have suggested, and as would certainly be the case if you subscribe to anything close to the hydroplate hypothesis due to excess heat, will not only reduce the solubility further, but will also leave obvious traces of itself in the form of residual trapping, which we do not see. Paleoenvironmental temperatures can be determined from rock using geochemical clues, frequently isotopic ratios. And boy do we ever not see any signs of the seas being at supercritical temperatures. This use of geochemistry to suss out clues of ancient paleoenvironments is something that's even accepted by many creationists, such as Warriker at Answers in Genesis. Opdyke and Wilkinson examined the Cretaceous, which is broadly considered to be flood rock, in the chart you can see on your screen now. The temperature specifics for aragonite and calcite, both considered to be calcium carbonate of course, show a much greater range of precipitation for aragonite than for calcite, aragonite precipitating much faster in warm water than calcite at its maximum range. But this maximum rate was 1.5 millimoles per square meter per hour for aragonite and 0.3 millimoles per square meter per hour for calcite at around 27 degrees Celsius. The the minimum range was 0.1 millimole per meter squared per hour for both calcium carbonate variants at 8 degrees Celsius. Their work showed that the rates hash out to an average of 1.1 meters or 3.6 feet per thousand years for the entirety of the Holocene. When we look at the limestone structures mentioned previously, along with the ocean temperature of their given time of formation, here's what we get. The White Cliffs of Dover were formed during the Cretaceous, when the temperature was 35 degrees Celsius or 95 degrees Fahrenheit. The Stone Forest in the Permian at 27.7 degrees Celsius or 82 degrees Fahrenheit. The Redwall Limestone from the Carboniferous at 15.5 degrees Celsius or 60 degrees Fahrenheit. And Notch Peak at the Cambrian Ordovician Boundary, which is 32.7 degrees Celsius or 91 degrees Fahrenheit. From the chart via Opdyke and Wilkinson, we can see that the moderate accumulation seems to crest around 26 degrees Celsius and then begins to fall at 27 degrees Celsius for both aragonite and calcite, demonstrating the impact that solubility has on accumulation. 
Point being, at around 80 degrees Fahrenheit, we see a height in accumulation followed by a steady decrease. This is modeled and demonstrated in Opdyke and Wilkinson's accumulation rates for the Cretaceous, which has a higher temperature and lower accumulation rate. The ecology is impacted by the temperature, suggesting perhaps that there is an ideal temperature range for aragonite utilizing microorganisms. This has also been covered by meta-analyses analyzing accumulation in 119 separate studies. The bottom line is, limestone seems to deposit at a maximum rate under ideal conditions, temperature conditions, of two inches per year in calm, warm, non-acidic, shallow seas. I don't think that anyone can make the case that the Noachian deluge that killed all terrestrial life on Earth abided by these conditions, but even if it did, you would get a maximal deposition rate for limestone during the year of the flood of two inches. The limestone layers we just got done listing, such as the 800 foot tall red wall limestone, are indeed considered to be flood rock by most flood geologists, and these limestone walls are smack dab in between much coarser layers with faster deposition rates by several orders of magnitude. Remember, the Earth's sedimentary rock is approximately 10% limestone, and of that 10%, the majority is marine in nature. This means that you can take the higher rate, higher end of rates that we see today for the accumulation of limestone, multiply it by 10 and give them 5,000 years for the entirety of the flood and still end up with 0.02% of the limestone volume that we see in modern times. <sighs> that sucks. That's, uh, I mean... Thank you. <laughs> So creationists are naturally very upset about this situation. They're very mad and have as such proposed a number of different solutions that do not work. The first is that some of them have tried to suggest that limestone could have been carried from other places by massive currents. But the problem with this is limestone of all types is highly soluble in water, meaning it would simply mix in and then would have to precipitate out again, which takes a long time. Creationists also point to the fact that limestone can form chemically. Good job, this is true. But they seemingly don't know that chemical limestone formation also involves the slow precipitation out of the water. Number two is invoking fast currents. Occasionally, they will invoke the mud flume experiments in order to account for limestone and other slow-forming strata. The idea is that a university performed an experiment that showed mudstone can deposit quickly in a flowing current. So, creationists wonder aloud, why could this not also be the case for limestone? Well, because of one massive and unviolated rule of current deposition. It has a telltale trace in the form of air pocket-like structures known as flocules. Without known exception, current deposited sediment contains flocules. And guess what no limestone formation has? That's right, it's flocules. The third attempt to solve the limestone problem involves volcanism. Creationists have heard of the concept of volcanic limestone and seem to think that that is when limestone is like belched out in magma flows. But volcanic limestone is simply when magma acts on an already existing limestone deposit that has had to already form, a process that involves, you guessed it, precipitation, deposition, accumulation, and a whole lot of time. Finally, they will point to fossils that are within limestone or chalk formations. Now, most fossils in limestone or chalk are shells, which are not easily broken down like bones are. This is why you find shells all along the beach. But every now and again, we get exceedingly rare fossils like fish or even small shoals of minnows. Fascinatingly enough, though, these are typically found with signs of downhill transportation, underwater mudslides of soft, not yet hardened limestone. And interestingly enough, this does in fact have physical, geological, telltale signs. 
Remember that modern geology necessitates local catastrophe as well as general uniformitarianism across the globe. This matches what we see. We get a few chalk or limestone fossils of larger organisms this big or, or in shoals or things of that nature. Uh, but by and large, we don't have that many of them, despite the fact that we see chalk and limestone dominating the sedimentary geologic record. If the flood truly did happen, these types of instantaneous fossils would not be rare. They would be ubiquitous. But there are, of course, additional limestone-style problems. The first is that limestone takes time to form into solid rock, even today, and particularly with limestone that is precipitating out of the water and accumulating on the seafloor. Thus, if all of it were deposited in a single year, the result would not be the great jagged cliffsides of Dover and the Grand Canyon, but instead gentle slopes. This is due to the rock's slow hardening rate, which would not have been solid by the time the Great Paleo Lake burst and carved the Grand Canyon as seen in flood geology to create said cliffs. Instead, the enormous limestone deposits would just slouch pitifully under their own soggy weight until they finally hardened. Some creationists have bucked back against this and instead argued that the Grand Canyon layers were not lithified during this Paleo Lake Dam breach scenario. However, this doesn't work. Many of the layers of the Grand Canyon, such as the Temple Butte Formation and the Red Wall Limestones, actually have chunks of them torn up and incorporated into the upper layers. This is due to the nature of erosion. Some of these are as big as minivans. You don't get those from soft rock, so within days of being deposited, these layers would have had to lithify into solid rock at rates never before seen, only to then be scoured, having these newly hardened rocks ripped off and incorporated somehow, maybe by quantum tunneling, into the layers above them. For many reasons, this simply isn't feasible. Additional problem number two is that limestone deposits can be readily distinguished as freshwater or saltwater. Freshwater limestone contains only freshwater microfossils and other fossilized organisms, and saltwater limestone contains only saltwater organisms and microfossils. This is highly problematic for a global flood where all the water supposedly mixed together, particularly since most freshwater life is intolerant to sudden salinity and most saltwater life to sudden freshwater influx. And remember, we're talking about microorganisms organisms who lack the metabolic abilities to even begin to cope with such rapid change. Problem number three, speaking of those marine microorganisms, if the flood is responsible for all of the marine limestone we see, including chalk, it must account for the ecosystems that housed this zooplankton and phytoplankton. That means, similar to the heat problem, creationists must cram some 500 million years of microscopic life, the same kind that makes up much of our marine limestone today, into around half a year. Considering phytoplankton alone makes up 45 billion tons of biomass each year today, and the oceans are smaller compared to periods such as that seen in the Cretaceous, this is entirely untenable. The whole sea then would have simply been a sludge of microscopic life. Problem number four is that limestone has a strange solubility trend. It is more soluble, dissolves more readily, that is, in cold water rather than warm water. This is why it precipitates out fastest in warm, calm seas. If the fountains of the deep were cold, all the limestone should be in a single layer on top of all the rest, precipitating out as the water warmed. If the fountains of the great deep were hot, then all the limestone should be near the bottom in a large band, having not been taken up at all by the surrounding water. Either way, limestone cannot be interspersed between any other type of layer, including simple clays, silts, and sands in any kind of flood model. Some creationists have tried to appeal to turbidity current transport in order to explain these limey sediments being brought in and interbedded within other layers. But again, if this is the case, we should see those flocules, and we do not. When creationists invoke this current-style deposition, occasionally called hyper-concentrated gravity currents, we also see two major problems. First, there's an issue with the sourcing. 
Depositing thousands of feet of sediment by gravity currents would require hundreds of thousands of enormous stockpiles of varying sediment types, and the fossils therein, totaling millions of cubic miles in order to be positioned strategically all over the world and distributed later by the flood. Many of these would have to be miraculously protected from earlier flood violence to be available for the source material for these later gravity flows. This problem is magnified when we begin to think about how tall the stock piles would have to be. Gravity currents cannot flow uphill, which means the stockpiles had to be at least twice as high as the thick, widespread deposits that they are purported to have formed. The math is pretty simple here. If the top half of a stockpile is swept away and deposited in a series of stacked gravity currents, the remaining stockpile should be the same height as the deposited sediments. With no height difference, the gravity flows would then cease. So the bottom half of these stockpiles should still be around somewhere to discover and examine. The only alternative here is that they were just miraculously perched on top of high plateaus all over the world, waiting for the coming flood. The second issue is that flood geologists essentially imply that all gravity currents triggered by submarine landslides during the flood were hyper-concentrated. In reality, low concentration turbidity flows are the most common type that we see. Responses to this bust will almost certainly involve strange or never before seen in the lab or in nature kind of processes, as well as appeals to pictures of fossils and rage over the fact that geology involves both long-term uniformitarian events and local catastrophe, that's why they call it actualism. But if you're confronted with these types of creationists, you can simply ask them for the papers that suggest such processes for the rapid accumulation of limestone or chalk. They simply won't provide the papers because the papers do not exist. So it seems that limestone has indeed precluded young earth creationism. Join me next time, my gentle and modern apes, for another bite-sized preclusion to some big, hefty pseudoscience.